Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Chen. I'm the Director of Analytics at the New York City Fire Department, um, where I oversee the newly established Analytics Unit. And it's a really exciting time to be in New York City government. We are uh, undergoing this uh, data revolution that's really moving us towards smart government. But uh, before I get into all that fun stuff, just a little background on myself, so you know who was talking. Um, I started off as an econometrician and management consulting, um, working in economic development work. Uh, during the Bloomberg administration, I joined uh, Mayor, the Mayor's Office of, Anal of Operations um, to work on data science projects. So I have 30, a small portfolio of 35 projects that ranged from uh, resource allocation right after Hurricane Sandy to predicting the outcome of lawsuits. So pretty interesting stuff from a very wide range of agencies. And then um, I had this opportunity at uh, the New York City Fire Department opened up, and it's a department that has not, never really dug into its data. And you, you might have read some books like um, you know, The Fires, but it's not really like that book. Um, so my job is to comprehensively reimagine how data can work for government. But it hasn't always been an agency where we've had um, all this data innovation. Uh, I have this print from 1865 hanging in my office, and it's, it's from a newspaper showing the new New York City Fire Department. And we were established in 1865. And back then, it was probably not some you probably would not have expected machine readable data. We didn't have 911, uh, 911 centers, 311 centers, um, computer data dispatch, and you would have to pick up after your fire engine, which is, was you know, horse, horse driven. And you know, over the last 149 years, we've come a long way. We're currently the largest fire department in the United States. We have an annual budget of $1.7 billion. And you know, it's a nice chunk of change. Um, 8.4 million residents, those are our constituents. We protect their lives and property. And we respond to about 1.6 million um, incidents between medical, water leaks, fires. Um, and believe it or not, we don't really respond to that many cats in the tree. <laughs> uh, our workforce is ginormous. We have uh, 10,000 firefighters and fire chiefs and um, different, fire, um, different ranks within the uniform side that operate 100, 198 fire engines, those are the things that squirt the water, 143 uh, uh, ladder, ladder trucks, those are the things that go and save your life. Uh, you have 3,700 EMTs um, and paramedics that um, man 650 ambulance tours, and that's pretty, pretty large, but we also need help from um, voluntary part participating hospitals that provide 250 additional ambulance tours. And then we have these really nice fire boats, courtesy of the federal government. I'm part of this small contingency of 1,600 civilians who support the operation in any way possible, including data. My team was established in June of 2013. And before that, there hasn't really been any use of data. We get millions of records every year, billions of records, depending on which data source you look at. But there hasn't really been much data use. So my responsibility was to actually have a sort of public sector data science startup within the fire department, supporting the whole agency. And that, that, that involved uh, a large portfolio of about 20 plus projects. And we worked to raise the technical sophistication across the department, offering training, getting people to start visualizing data, and start to calculate uh, different useful metrics. We've dove into our injury data, try to figure out how do people get injured on the job. We, a, lar a, lar number of, um, a large number of EMTs get back injuries. And so we did a lot of d deep dives to figure out why do they get injuries, and we want to reduce that. Um, we do a lot of forecasting to support our long-term strategic planning. So we, we do forecasting for the EMS side, figure out how many what's the number of um, medical incidents that you should expect over the next fiscal year, and that's going to be an additional 33,000, which is about 3.75% growth. Uh, pretty steep for um, medical incidents. But there's this, there's this whole chunk of, of core activity that I'm going to talk about today, and there are three areas, very distinct. Uh, first bit is Firecast. It's our in-house uh, predictive risk engine. The second piece 
uh, deals with recruitment science. Uh, we are responsible for hiring the best, the biggest, and the brightest uh, firefighters in the country. So, what goes into that? And also, um, our contribution to the open data uh, movement, which, you know, it's growing and it has a lot of uh, potential impacts on economic development and technological development. So, Firecast. Um, it often takes a tragedy to change how organizations work. And for the fire department, we moved towards risk-based management after the Deutsche Bank fire of 2007. So the Deutsche Bank building, for those of you, those of you who, know, who don't know the story, uh, was fatally damaged after the 9-11 attacks. And as a result, over a number of years, contractors were responsible for um, remediating all the, the hazardous material inside, so like all the asbestos, and also demolishing the building floor by floor. You can't really just put charges in a building like this in downtown Manhattan and expect that everything will be <coughs> peachy. So these contractors erected all these new walls within these buildings, within the building, to contain the asbestos, to change how the air flowed through the building. Um, you can already start to secure and see how things can go wrong. Uh, for, the water pipes were, dim were turned off. So as a result, when there was a fire, the fire is not going to move through the building the, the right way. The intelligence from three different city agencies wasn't shared. And when we responded, we couldn't put out the fire, couldn't get the water on the fire quick enough. Two fires, the fires were caught somewhere in the building and perished. I hear some, alarm, uh, some um, sirens in the background. So, after that, we've embraced a couple noble truths and re redimented our risk mitigation philosophy, which basically now states that fires will happen, it's just a matter of time, and we just have to get our units to inspect the buildings of highest risk before anything, ha anything else happens. So we have to be prepared, and if possible, we have to prevent. And a large part of this is driven by this notion of inspections. And we've been conducting inspections since the 1950s. And this, this is FDNY's um, mainstream technology since 1950. <laughs> we have these pink cars that have a building on each, on each one of them. And every time you go and inspect a building, this little pink car that sits somewhere haphazardly within a firehouse chronicles all those inspections. But if we, were to, if we were to move to a dynamic risk-based system, we have to have dynamic information. We can't rely on pink cards that rank buildings based on perceived risk, which is pretty static. So, um, and what, what is a technology um, product without an uh, overly complicated diagram? Uh, we have uh, established CIVIDOS, which is the Coordinated, build coordinated Building Inspection data analysis system. And now we collect data from across New York City government, 39 agencies that come within to come into FDNY. We take that data and we push it into our risk space inspection system. Um, the main piece, the predictive risk algorithm, is Firecast, which I'm going to talk about in depth. And Firecast really dictates how we do our inspections. It looks at all this data streaming in from across the city and then produces risk scores and prioritizes how each, <coughs> each fire company does, in this, does in inspections. There are a lot of other aspects to it that will reach other parts of the agency that will eventually have handhelds um, that will make um, data collection far better. We'll also do have much better um, visualization and analytics in the future, but for now we're focused on the Firecast algorithm. But we just can't go and inspect buildings. We have a building portfolio of one million buildings in New York City. We can only inspect one third of those buildings, so that's 330,000 buildings, um, mainly because those are buildings that are inspection qualified. If things are not inspection qualified because of the Constitution. We can't just go into someone's apartment and just you know, go willy nilly. Uh, we can only get to about 10% of the 330,000 buildings every year because of the various engagements. We have about nine hours per week to conduct inspections. So we do a thing called three by three. Three hours per day for three times a week. And during that time, we have to get as many inspections 
completed, but there are a lot of obstacles. For instance, the 490, 493, nearly half a million um, incidents that we have to respond to that take precedence over our inspections. And every time that the heat goes above 105 and the heat index, you don't do inspections. If, who here has been in fire, firefighter bunker year? It's, isn't it hot? Right? So if you're going outside, and this stuff that protects you from everything known to man, well, not really, but just about, um, you, if you have a 105 degree heat index value, you're going to be not a very happy camper while doing your inspections. The firecast pedigree has really grown in a very short amount of time. In March of 2013, we developed version 1.0, which was, well, really a vendor came in and conducted focus group discussions and created a whole model based on discussion. Um, it had the right factors, but if you create um, weights for a predictive model based on discussion, it's not going to be particularly accurate. So that's why my team has a, has a job. In June of 2013, my team joined, and within one month we deployed version 2.0, which moved from a gut-based approach to a statistical science approach. And as a root of entry model really meant to get the department moving. You don't, if you're teaching someone to drive, you don't give them Ferrari right on the first day. You give them something that's probably beaten up so that you know, things work out. And then as you pick up steam, you'll probably move to, towards a better car. And so that's the exact philosophy that we, we've employed here. So this second model has 13 building factors and it turns out to be pretty accurate. But we didn't stop there and we moved, we moved on to version 3.0, which I'll talk at length later in the presentation. Um, a little background on fire patterns in New York City. If you took all the fire incidents that happened between 2002 and 2013 in New York City and just rasterized the data, you start to see um, immediate patterns emerge. So all Manhattan is lit up. That's all the person traffic going on. Um, Northern Brooklyn, Southern Queens, um, there, there turns out to be a, a big fire pocket as well as in the Bronx. We develop a better appreciation when we start to stratify the data. And this really shows you the, the power of just using a statistical approach rather than a gut-based gut approach. When we stratify the data by building use, um, there's a really clear difference in how uh, buildings, the, the fire trends, appear. So if you look at only one or two family homes, there is a fire belt across Brooklyn and Queens. But then commercial and high-rise fires are where you expect them to be. So we did a whole ton of analyses to develop 2.0, and it's very basic. And we developed this um, consistent risk model. It's based on constant factors, but constantly risky factors. And we, def we defined it simply based on the probability of fire ignition given structural characteristics. So across these 13 factors that really expand out to about 60 some subcategories, you, um, a building in the 99th percentile of risk may be an elevator apartment building with semi-fireproof store. Um, it was built before the 1938 code revision. Um, it's about six floors, so six floors by 90 feet across. So there's some some consistent some large number of people within the building. It's located in central Brooklyn. Uh, so these are like very static factors, but there, there, there is a lot of predictive value behind them. And within the first 30 days, we saw a 19% bump in our violation in volume. By day, day 60, after we deployed, uh, there was the, the bump dropped to 10%. But that's expected, because as you go down um, the risk list, things become less and less risky. Now, like, there, there's, there's something to be said about getting toward getting towards this um, Spielbergian ideal of having a precog. And in light of that, we developed a new measure called the pre-arrival coverage rate. And it's our way of trying to measure the percent of buildings that experienced a fire that we got to within 90 days before the fire. So remember, like, fires are going to happen. Like, fires are going to happen in someone's apartment. We can't inspect that apartment, but at least we should know the layout of the building so that when we get there, we can be faster and more efficient and more effective. And so using this PACR pre-arrival coverage rate, we found that the original model, the version 1.0, 
only got to 1.9%. But under our revised model, we got to 16.5%. So it was an eight times improvement uh, in model accuracy. Firecast 3.0 is, is really a pioneering effort for the fire service nationally. We, we pulled out all stops for this. And this is, we just went from the Kia to the Ferrari. We now incorporate machine learning. We have redefined how risk works. We, we're looking at fire condition as, um, as a condition upon structural characteristics, violation activity, and person activity. So now we get the, the static characteristics that are always risky. Now we're starting to get 7,500 risk factors from across New York City government. And we suck these in, and we start to see different patterns emerge. But not only that, we, we decided to develop a model for every single geography, administrative geography. So each fire battalion, all 49 battalions, now have a model. And they're calibrated to those battalions so that the patterns that are unique, the behaviors that are unique to a geographic area are reflected. So interestingly, like you have a lot of the structural characteristics that we used before, we added more detail on, on space use, but then we added the behavioral cues violation activity, like behavioral cues such as excessive noise and air quality complaints. It turns out the only, can anyone guess what's the only factor that, that spans all 49 battalions? Well, that's, yes. that's, that's a good guess. No. Noise. NYPD noise complaints of unruly and party-like behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only thing that, that seems to be um, statistically significant across the whole city. Other than that, it's a, it's a kind of a random combination and depends on what's happening in those areas. Now this model, we, we, we believe, based on all our simulation testing, that will be able to achieve one in four. So one in four buildings that will have a fire will be inspected within 90 days before the fire. Um, one, one day, maybe one in two, maybe it'll be full all of them one day, but who knows. So that's Firecast. Excuse me. Sure. So if you're inspecting them, why are there still fires? Do you have any measure of progress? Uh, so, fires so to understand the inspections, there's a there's the policy aspect, which is what should happen. There's the predictive analytics side, which is we believe that this is going to happen in this building. And then there's the preventive aspect, which is dependent on what standard operating protocols require and what you can actually do legally. So a lot of fires may actually occur within someone's apartment, but we can't inspect those. And in terms of education and outreach, we, can, we have initiatives for that, but we haven't actually implemented um, measures to figure out the effectiveness of the education outreach. Um, so our stance is the fire is likely to happen, but our response to those fires will be far faster and far better. And and we actually have anecdotal evidence that suggests that we are our guys are getting more um, more prepared for when we actually respond. Like have who here has been in a building that that experienced a fire? Okay, so oftentimes, um, when you have a building that's, that's on fire, fire to fire will go in, it'll be completely dark. You don't know what's going on. You're trying to find your way to the fire. And the only way you would know how to get there is if you have been there beforehand, or you have a, an actual blueprint. And believe it or not, you don't actually have the blueprints for every single building in the city. So the best, the best way to prepare a firefighter when responding is actually to visit and understand what the layout is and knowing where the hazards are. So there, there are multiple benefits to the inspection activity. Uh, so in some sense, though, if you start to, if the inspection starts to succeed, then your data will start to, you know, slowly move away from you. So like the 25%, mm -hmm. what if you, what if you got an increase, but also you got really good at your inspections? If you find the other direction, then it'll be hard to control for the two, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it'll, it'll get there, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. On, on average, how frequent are buildings uh, being inspected? We do. So this year was actually an anomaly. We we hit uh, we pushed for fifty thousand inspections this year. Um, usually, it's about thirty three thousand risk inspections. But we have other types of inspections that are required by law, and those are another thirty thousand. Like, so 
So uh, if I'm, I'm a building owner, do I expect my building to be inspected once a year, once every few years? So that's under the old system, but then now it depends on what, if there has been previous activity on your property, if there have been any signs of structural um, negligence within your building. If there's none of that, then we're probably not going to be inspecting. But right? let's say that we start getting all sorts of calls about um, noise complaints, rodents, water leaks, you name it, then chances are it wouldn't be there at least once a year. How do you explain the connection between noise complaints and fires? Um, this is a good one. My stance is that it's, we're using pure machine learning, so we're not making a we're not making a causal connection. We're using pure. It's order. a marker. It's a marker. Yeah. So we've had multiple um, stages. Interestingly, we have a hotline for all inspections. So every time someone goes into a building and they have a question on how to do, the, to do an inspection properly, they can call a hotline. Um, but in terms of our involvement, we've largely been on the targeting end. So we tell, we tell our firefighters where to go. As for what they do there, it's up to what the law says and what uh, previous policy has stated. Um, our goal was to move into um, what is actually done during the inspection, um, but we don't think we have the proper data to make those sort of connections. Does your analysis include the outliers in terms of, like, you analyze those to find out how, how much they don't figure out with your predictive analysis? So, for instance, how will you avoid not expecting a building that fit that, that shouldn't get fired, but that fire? We, we, do those, do, we do do those analyses, like, for instance, um, but it doesn't, oh, it's usually retrospective. And if you don't really, uh, that's not necessarily feedback into policy, it's really just to check to see how we're doing. So for instance, the Harlem explosion, and, I, and I'll move on after uh, this question. But the Harlem explosion, um, we rank the building at 89%. But that, but that still means that there are a few, a few thousand buildings ahead of that one building. Uh, but we do do retrospective analyses to look for these uh, potential outliers. So I have one question. So, um, so uh, do you also work with insurance? Uh, not currently. It's, it's all in-house currently. Um, there's a seizure and use and diagram that I put up here. Uh, and this is really just to show the sort of uh, dynamic nature of the risk model. So going, um, each row represents a different building in a given battalion. And then going across each of these columns represents a slice of time. And if you just choose any one of these, Points, you start to see that the, um, the risk scores, the red being high risk, blue being low risk, it will fluctuate based on what's happening in those buildings. All right, so I'll move on to the next step recruitment analytics slash recruitment science. And we're going to focus largely on the, fire, the firefighters, about 10,000 firefighters, and it's really hard to recruit for them. It's a really big process and we, we're, we have some obstacles due to administrative and legal requirements. Um, it's a lot of process issues, but we, as analytics team, we try to improve the process. So once we're, we're, we're tied to a four-year cycle. So once every four years, we open up the application process for people to apply to the fire department as a firefighter. They have to take a fire, um, a civil service exam so that we can see if they're qualified. If your score is sufficiently high, your score gets ranked. If your, oh wait, if your score is, wait, I'll get that. All scores get ranked. If your score is sufficiently high, you get screened. And you get screened for your, your physical fitness, your, any sort of medical conditions, mental health, uh, among other factors. And then if you're among the lucky, you'll enter the fire academy, which turns out to be a very grueling um, academic and physical process. We start off with 145,000 expressions of, expressions of interest. 
our fire our recruiters were usually fire officers and firefighters go out into the field and over I guess a, a one year period they, they pound the streets for people to express some interest. They fill out this pink form and blue form sometimes to to get information on the department. During the application phase, uh, we received just under 60,000 um, applications, 46% of which are, are reached by our recruiters. Even less people actually take the exam, so we have a 71% participation rate on the test, so 42,000 folks take the test. The top 7,200 people get considered to go through the hiring process. And that's if your score is sufficiently high. But not everyone makes it. You have 2,400 people who make it in that. So it's a 5.6% um, uh, acceptance rate. At Columbia University's MBA program, we, we remove all the, the quality of factors. So Columbia University's MBA program accepts about 20%. So it's a little, it gets a little tough. And all of this is just to get the next generation of the bravest, to get folks who are sufficiently smart and strong to run into a burning building to pull you out of it. So the analytics um, involvement in the recruitment effort was to digitize, analyze, and optimize. Before we got involved, um, expressions of interest forms were largely these, these uh, paper forms. And there were a lot of uh, entry, data entry errors because it was all paper. People didn't always fill out all the information. So it made it really difficult to track people in terms of their interest. So we changed all that. We developed a, a mobile app so that our, our um, recruiters can go in the field. And as they're talking to you, they can take that information, all validated, and it goes, gets um, sent directly into our servers. And that's currently being beta, beta tested. We also were interested in job comp competitiveness. So 5.6%, that's tough. Four year, waiting four years to hear a response from, from the fire department, that's tough. So, <laughs> so we have uh, partnered with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, which is uh, long for HR, citywide HR. And they provided a lot of information on job application behavior. And we looked at basically everyone who applied to the firefighter exam, what other public sector jobs that we apply to, and we have that type of information. And based on that, you can start to see different patterns, like who is applying to what, why, what are they really interested in, what are their real motives. And we found that about 50% of, of applicants apply to at least one other civil service exam. And just generally, when you put all this into a network diagram, uh, the main circle in the middle, this, these are all the firefighters. These are police officers over here. I mean, police, police fire, uh, police department exams. The size of the circle represents the number of applications. The line between the two represents the number of co-applications. Up in the right, that's corrections. Over here, this is sanitation. And you start to see these interesting patterns emerge. But what does that mean in terms of customer segmentation? We want to find patterns. We want to find a profile of where we have to improve. And so that's where we started to make all sorts of interesting network diagrams to figure out um, what are people's real interests. So on the bottom left, these folks, they only want a few jobs. They, they, they really just want to apply to fire, the firefighter exam, police department exam, uh, corrections and sanitation. But on the bottom right, these folks are applying to basically everything under the sun. So now, we have, so now we're starting to understand that some folks just have a strong interest in the job. Other folks are looking for a job. And if someone's looking for a job and they're getting paid for it, they might, might lower the chance of them actually coming over to the department if we don't get to them first. So the, these sort of analyses, and again, mountains of these analyses have been conducted, uh, these are really informing how we go forward with our outreach strategies. Uh, in, in terms of optimization, we've done some of work that, that speeds up the picture. Um, it seems you're using statistics to make things that behavioral analysis that falls on the cycle, psychology. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any psychologists back in the cycle? 
Well, the thing is we don't have psychometric information. This is just purely based on application behavior. So we're not talking about um, this psychological um, profiles that we're building, but these are based on interest. So we did, going back here, like looking at these sort of network analyses based on people's job pattern, job application patterns, we can see that there are clusters of behavior. So versus down here, we know that this whole quadrant is all transport. All this stuff down here, and they're really small, but over here, that's all social services. And up here, this is all the, the law enforcement. So we do, you do see intuitive clusters and different and distinct profiles within these areas, but um, in the end, it's um, largely correlative. Um, we, we have thought about psychometric analyses, but we haven't uh, deployed that. Where could we build other sites? You want the best out of the chain, not just the most interesting. Uh, right, but when we go through the best applicant process, we, we, when we were looking for the best applicant, um, we put them through the ringer. You have to be able to run a mile and a half under 13 minutes. By the time you finish the academy, you have to be able to run that under 12 minutes. You have to do a whole host of other activities like that are fire related, it's very physical, under 18 minutes, about 13 different, um, different types of tests. We have the uh, academics that are tested for very heavily, so it's a very rigorous exam. Um, so we do have a lot of quality controls in there. Um, in order to retain interest in the program, we have uh, a mentor-mentee program. We have all these firefighters on the left, all the mentees on the, the right. And before analytics involvement and in optimization of activities, the department would take 30 to 60 days to match mentees to mentors based on their preferences. Like if they have um, like a baseball team they want to talk about, the um, ethnicity, gender, location of the city. So that took 30 to 60 days to do. Um, my team was stood up and we came over and helped these guys out. Um, our, mentor, our, our algorithm took less than five minutes to compute. So it was a 63 to 8400 time improvement in terms of how fast we can turn around the, these internal processes. And the last bit is on open data initiatives. So there's a lot of buzz um, about open data. Like the Obama, Obama administration has released a lot of documents, um, orders to push forth open data. Um, Eric Bloomberg signed Global Law 11 of 2012 to, to release all of, FD, uh, all of New York City's data. And so uh, FDNY is complying, but we want to make sure that we can make it, you know, do it in a way that helps New York City. And every, every year, our computer aid dispatch programs and systems chronicle millions of moments when New York City, um, New York City uh, residents, New Yorkers, are in greatest need. And this is just a, a rudimentary stream graph of over 24 hours. What are the main medical um, instances that occur? So a lot of people just call in sick. Very generic. But from FDNY, we see that, that just from the Firecast initiative, that if we took our internal data and we matched it up with all the open data available, we can create the next generation of emergency services. And we want to see that happen across the country. We want to foster new technological development, economic development, and this is what we're going to do. We're making it work for the user. We want to make sure that the data we put out there is useful. It's not just putting out the data to comply with the law. It has to be useful. And in order to do so, we've uh, taken on a four-pronged approach. We established an analytics advisory board comprised of private and public sector partners. We have the uh, United Nations Global Pulse Initiative. We have Columbia University and New York University. New York Life, Context Relevant, which is a new startup based in Seattle. Our fellow New York City agencies. And they've they sat down with us on multiple occasions to talk through what is important to consider when you're releasing data. What, it, what should go into to the sensitivities and privacy issues around data? What would people really want to use the data for? And that really played into the creation of our internal governance and gov governance policies. And we really pushed to make governance within FDNY around data um, a community process. 
And before, before the team's arrival, um, data was sometimes haphazardly released. And we really shouldn't be doing that, because there are a lot, a lot of considerations, like privacy considerations, usefulness, um, delivery aspects. But now, um, governance is really a comprehensive process where we have all the internal groups, so the executive, the, com the commissioner's office, our BI teams, our, the data owner, which oftentimes will be some firefighters. Uh, we, have our, we, have, we establish a pub public beta testing group, which I'll talk about in a sec. And we have a very, very much a best practices approach to ensuring that when we release the data, it's going to be good and ethical and useful. And when we talk about all that, all the different governance and ethics issues with uh, our internal stakeholders, you really have to do a sort of um, rope a dope. Everyone familiar with the rope a dope? You know, you, someone's boxing. Um, you have to just make sure that the other person who's trying to throw punches at you wears out. Well, this is the thing. You want to release data. People don't want to release data. You have to get all the concerns out there right off the bat. And all your proponents are going to talk about innovation, research, and the transparency and the exciting aspects of releasing data, the potential of data. But then all your, your opponents will talk about sensitivity, security, protection, uh, PII, which is huge. But as soon as, as, so as long as you get it out there right in the beginning, um, you, get, you, you set expectations, it makes the data release possible. Uh, a couple months ago, we had our first beta testing session. We had an internal data dive. We invited uh, about 20 folks to FDNY to have um, a, a first look at the data that we're planning to release. And we got really amazing feedback and really allowed us to test to see if Firecast made sense. So a lot of people arrived at the same conclusions as we did when developing Firecast. We also developed, figured out how data should, the data should be structured and what people would really want to use the data for, which, is really, which really is a test ground and ensures that we deliver properly. You don't want to just put it out there. You want to make sure that it's proper. And it was, it was a very interesting session because folks, um, each person there gave their insight into what they thought was a strength and what was a weakness. And going forward, we want to advance the cause of data science within the fire service by having the first FDNY prize for advancing, for the advancement of machine learning in the fire service. We want to basically um, stim stimulate the economy and the interest in the data intelligentsia so that we have smarter tools for the fire service. And also we're working to get new resource partnerships in place so that uh, we, we can continue to innovate with our data. Uh, years two and three are largely going to be spent uh, working on the sustainable analytics plan, making sure that uh, data science is integrated into every single aspect within the department, and also um, the Open Data Initiative part two. Done. Thank you. Have any other fire departments in large cities, say, around the world done anything similar to this? Um, I know the London Fire Department has some sort of targeting approach, but I don't know how statistical it is. Um, LA, LA Fire Department, they have developed a data repository. I don't know if they've deployed any sort of analytical uh, predictive engine on top. Um, interestingly, even Auckland, New Zealand, as far as in, out in New Zealand, they've um, started the, the ball rolling on getting predictive work done. Um, off the ground. But currently, we're the, the main um, fire service. Are you looking to develop a model that might be used for fire departments in other cities? Uh, is that a concern? Well, we've offered. Um, the, the thing is that there's no um, unified data, data mm -hmm. across the right. country. Um, but you know, the algorithmic approach is, can, can be applied. Did you? Yeah. Um, you mentioned sort of the open data part two. So, is, is what you, your beta release, was that part one? Um, or, and if so, what, when, when can we, what can we expect in sort of the short term? So the goal is to get something out by January 2015, uh, okay. like a full, first full release. Cool. Um, 
And oh, then what we have. It, 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 currently, it's scheduled to be a computer aid dispatch for for fire, the fire department side. We are, we're still working through a couple of the, the PII issues. Um, some departments in the country have released um, the building and address information. Uh, we're we're still working through the legality of that. Sounded like applications like Firecast had input from other city agencies, whether it be noise or, or sort of sanitary, you know, uh, department of sanitation. Are you collaborating with those departments? Um, and sort of what other city agencies are you working with to build up? Uh, we actually are doing this mostly in house. Uh, luckily, most city agencies uh, toss their data onto this interagency data share called uh, DataBridge, formerly known as DEEP. There are a lot of um, acronyms of government. Uh, we take the data as, as is, and we have developed, a, in the, now the Firecast algorithm, we've developed all sorts of scrubbers to take care of the data. But we haven't really collaborated with any other agencies. How much sharing of the infrastructure, like the scrubbing, like the linking of the analytics to the data, and so on, is how much sharing of the infrastructure is going on, or is planned between other agencies? with you and or police or Currently, it hasn't been planned. Nothing has been planned in terms of sharing, but we have offered to build out um, algorithms with other city agencies if they're interested. Um, but we, we are all about, all about collaboration, and the department is very much open to future collaboration. So, uh, I think you asked the same question. The data. The data? Yeah. I think answer this question. Oh, okay. Sure. Gotcha. Um, we open for everyone. We've we got uh, about three quarters of the data uh, from 311. Um, and that's open, that's on the open data uh, portal. Uh, we got the other quarter of the data from ECB, Environmental Control Board, which has a lot of violation information that hasn't been released yet. My question is, uh, the other thing you might ask, uh, what? Does this model account for weather like seasons? Like we account for those uh, conditions. So, because every day like there's two leaves, we have seen for mm -hmm. the mission. Mm -hmm. I, more fires in summer, mm -hmm. and then we have winter. Uh, there are seasonal factors uh, as discrete factors within the model. Huh. Um, but it's really up to the model to see what's, what matters um, based on the time of day or the time of the week. Uh, we do, since we do look at about 7,500 factors, um, there are a lot, of, a lot of seasonal factors in there, and those all get picked up over time. In data processing terms, I see you're trying to mitigate some very uh, unlikely events mm -hmm. using large amounts of data. So, I mean, well, fatalities are extremely rare, mm -hmm. right? Particularly fire departments. So, how do you, well, without a rich history of these very rare events, right. where's the confidence? So, we have 25,000 structural fire incidents in New York City per year. Um, deaths are, they're not, not 25,000 large, but they exist. But in terms of signal, they're not quite there. So we largely focused on the, pop, the chance of ignition happening at all. So 25,000 per year, going back um, to like 10 years, that's, that's a nice amount of signal to deal with. Um, and we found that uh, using all these other uh, data sources with, as you said, questionable quality, uh, it does, the model does adjust for itself over time. It's, it, it gets refreshed very frequently. So it does um, pick up trends that are emerging very quickly, emerging quickly, but then when they're no longer um, a factor, they just drop out. Uh, what kind of tools or languages platforms on? Sure. Um, our our mo main analytical platform is just R. We, we, we do most of the work in R. We have we have some folks who do Python. Um, in terms of the, the code, that the overall platform is based partly on um, PL SQL and Oracle, as well as uh, combined with R. Um, we, we can't use any um, really costly systems. 
uh, because we're a public agency, so we decided to MacGyver it most of the way. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. It works. Uh, my question is on user adoption. Mm -hmm. um, and in any model or tool that's developed, it usually comes down to user adoption is always an issue, and getting people to buy in. Have you found that there's any teams or battalion or groups that adopt the tool more than others, and have you approached certain groups differently that way? That's the beauty of being in a uniform agency. There are, there are rank and file. So when we deployed Firecast, it was onto all the firefighters. All the fire companies had to follow the protocol of inspecting a building. So when they had their nine hours, they go print out um, their inspection sheet, and that was that came that came out of Firecast. Um, they can't deviate from that at all. Piggybacking off that, sure. So the healthcare consultant and you know, physicians, when we went to EMR, had an EHR health records. Mm -hmm. Some doctors get so fed up with using it, they screw it, and they rush the process. Or now with user adoption, the rank and file system, could that be an issue? Have you seen that reports aren't filled out? Appropriately, or does Firecast make it kind of dummy proof and you know you can't screw it up? There are, there are issues, like we do work through that all the time. Um, the risk based inspection side, like the, 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 the user platform, the front end side, that's it's pretty intuitive, but there are occasional hiccups that we have to go and go into the field and uh, rectify issues. And you have something that picks up on, or some kind of, it looks like, some kind of program looks like the will highlight and flag. We have basically an army of between the analytics team, the developer team, the hotline. We have a we have about sixty people working on the project. Did you have any input on the cost? Not currently. There, well, that's actually, it's actually interesting because when we moved from the paper system to um, an online system, it. It was accompanied with a comprehensively new inspection protocol. So whether or not the, it was the targeting that improved fire outcomes or um, the, inspect, the new inspections, it's hard to tell because everything was rolled out pretty, pretty simultaneously. We don't have the luxury to like, you know, do it like, as a phase rollout. Did you look at the operations and efficiency within the department? Like how fast an engine can get to a fire and what factors? Forecasting traffic. Um, we don't do forecasting traffic. We do look at our response times, um, but we haven't uh, linked up everything just yet. It's a pretty new program. It's only been in operation for about a year and a half, so we're waiting for it to just um, get its legs on the ground. Um, I, around the two-year mark, um, we we'll start to do some evaluations on response times, uh, improvements, and all the other uh, operational factors. Right. Um, so the team is really five people large. It's a very we have we have one thousand six hundred civilians. We're only five people large, um, and that's it's it's a it's a tough thing because you have to, in order to grow, we need to get grant funding, and so we do have grant funding coming in, and that should add on another two lines. Um, in terms of the overall budget, it's pretty pretty small. Again, we MacGyver everything. Um, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that you know, would like to share this information with uh, the fire departments mm -hmm. and there are no uh, existing standards. So can you talk about that a little bit, what type of standards you like to see? Um, it's a good question. Um, so the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA, they, they are the main um, standards setting organization for the fire departments across the country. They're not a federal organization, they're a nonprofit. Uh, they have invested quite a bit of um, time and effort into uh, developing and trying to figure out what should a standard be for data analytics. Um, I'm fortunately on the committee to actually create, I'm currently writing a chapter for how the research roadmap should be for data analytics, but there hasn't really been anything. I do think that, like my stance is that a lot of departments need to train, get firefighters to actually um, 
understand how analytics works, like the technical aspects, mainly because uh, if you become a firefighter, you're, you may become a lifer with the department. You might do a lot of um, work with the department throughout your life. If you're a civilian, um, it's less stable. So the institutional knowledge has to stay within the department, which means you have to raise the level of sophistication. Um, and so analytically, you gotta start, at least start with an Excel, Excel tutorial for every single firefighter. And then once you get all that done, once everyone's understanding the basic statistical mechanics, then we can move on to the really advanced program. If you look at doing any deep historical data, I mean, obviously you may not have good quality data going back on it. Going back 20 years, you must have the data in analog somewhere. Uh, we do. We do have we do have data going back to about 1993. Um, but in terms of building characteristics, it's it's very difficult. Um, if you've worked with building data in New York City, um, there are actually like three, principally three, building identification systems. There's the building identification number, which is um, out of the Department of Buildings. There is the tax lot, which is from the Department of City Planning, and then the Department of uh, wait, Housing Preservation and Development. They have their own system. I don't know why, but they have their own system. So we have these disparate systems that account for how buildings, what building, what constitutes a building, which means that the characteristics over time will, will change. The first digitized city plans were really made available in 2002, but they were in CAD, AutoCAD, which means that if you try to match it up with all the, the fine um, GIS platforms, it makes it really difficult. So we don't really, we were a five person team, and it's hard to push it, you know, um, aggregate all the information into a usable format. What about this fire department data on, say, fires? How much data you got there? Um, so I know so it's going to be analog. So in terms of the CAD information, like the computer aided dispatch, that goes back to, like, the 19th. I, I, in terms of the volume, I can't speak to that. So if the mayor calls you and said, Jeff, you're my guy, you've got a blank check, spend as much money as uh -huh. you do whatever you want, where, where would you take this? What would you do? Oh, wow, that's a, well, I, I guess being, blank check. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's big, that's huge. Um, first thing is, I would probably want to make sure that all the, the bureaus within the department that have any sort of inspection activity have some sort of unified um, data system. So everyone's hooked into the same system. In terms of targeting, it's all off one targeting platform. Um, but you know, the fire service goes way beyond just the fire, the fire side. We have like the recruitment aspects with the EMS, we have the medical data, um, injury data, fleets information, a huge amount of fleets information. Um, I, I, start, I know the cost of <coughs> aggregating everything into some unified system, and that's tremendous, probably not worth it, so the vast majority would be spent on developing human capital pipeline into the department. This guy in the deck. I was going to ask, like, when events like Hurricane Sandy happen, mm -hmm. does the model have power to make, like, immediate decisions and predictions that can be used on the ground as things are happening? Um, well, we haven't used it, so just to clarify, we, did, we haven't used it during Sandy. It was only deployed in 2013. Um, but in terms of immediacy, I would say that when Hurricane Sandy happens, we don't, we don't actually inspect. It's, our, for all, it's all about allocating resources so that we can get people out. So this, this system is designed for fires and for building inspection. It's not for uh, a good response. In terms of the next iteration of Biocast, would you consider tightening the window from say, 90 days to 60 days or something like that? How does it well? It has been a, it's been a, a point of contention, um, and within the department, we've been debating it for a while. Um, some folks want to see it as a one year window, because that's how we report uh, to City, City Hall. Um, I, I, I advocated for a 90 day window because it has just enough immediacy that it's kind of it's relevant, um, but we can we have debated about different windows. It hasn't been really been set in stone. So two questions. One is uh, things like blackouts must kind of mess with your data, 
that weren't lighting candles. <laughs> and stuff. Do you how do you find do you have like some variables that say, oh, okay, this is you know, this is noisy data in this section, we're not gonna count it, or do you just kind of let them all um, you account for these like bizarre events that could spike it? The the algorithm has so in the scrubbing portion, it does look for a signal by geographic area. And if it's not enough signal, we we drop certain factors. Um, but then if it doesn't correlate if it, if it, um, effectively, I mean, significantly, then we, we also drop that. I, I just mean, yeah, like during, you know, let's say there's a two-day blackout and suddenly you see, oh, there's more fires on Mondays and Tuesdays because that happened to be the days that the blackout was. You'd be kind of driven by this outlier. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Yeah, I, I, I'm just not really a big concern. And the other question is, there's sort of a, there's a bit of fear in the open data community that with uh, the, the new mayor, whether he's going to sort of embrace open data in the same way. Um, uh, this is this is obviously a sign that you know there's really cool things happening. Can you comment on the state of the group that you that you left? Is that still in you know the same size as it was? Um, um, there are three. So there are three mayor's office teams. Okay. Um, I think two of them got consolidated under my old office. Um, so there's the data group within Mayor's Office of Operations, there's the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, and then there's the Center for Innovation through Data Intelligence, which is the HHS branch. Um, the HHS branch is growing, the operations groups are have consolidated, um, and that's all that's all I know. And are there other like agencies that are doing something like this, taking someone from that group and, and creating a chief, you know, that person like <laughs> Um, th there are analytics groups in other parts of city government that haven't poached from the mayor's office. Though I can't say that the um, the only case. Thank you so much. Sir.